And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Do this, and you will live. And then later on, Jesus says, Go and do likewise, referring to the parable. Perhaps that's why you came to church today. You came to sit at the feet of Jesus, like this lawyer, and be told what you must, be, what you must do to be saved. And the lawyer answered rightly, that you must love the Lord your God and your neighbor with your whole being. Jesus demands that love spread throughout your whole body and soul into all your members, from your head to your foot, from your inside to your outside, so that everything is done with love and delight toward God and neighbor. That's what God demands. Maybe that's why you like the parable of the Good Samaritan, who does everything that God has required of him, and surely God will reward him with life and salvation for it. So taking this scripture alone, that means there's also then no place for you to be annoyed with one another. There can be no loathing of the person nearby you, your neighbor. You can't even be, with a moment of hesitation, reluctant to care for him. Your eyes must overlook anything indecent. Your ears must never be offended. Your mouth must never speak anything evil. Your hands and feet have to remain clean and innocent in all that they do. In short, you must be clean in your thoughts, kind in your words, above reproach in your works, disciplined in your seeing, genuine in your listening, honest in everything. Like the Good Samaritan. And thereby you will keep God's word and live. Do this and you will live. But how's that going to work out for you? Is it going to? If we take Jesus seriously and even the lawyer's answer, which is right, from the Shema, Jesus has set up an impossible standard of rules, statutes, and decrees that not even the most virtuous and noble person could ever accomplish. But just because you can't do it, and nobody can, that doesn't mean it isn't true. But you, like the lawyer, you want it to be true. You want to find a way to live by your doing. You cannot bear to hear and see that, according to Jesus and the apostolic doctrine, you haven't even begun to do what the Lord demands, let alone accomplished anything. Which is why he asks, who is my neighbor? Try to find some little wiggle room, some way to squeeze through in order to justify yourself, to make yourself right with God. You want to limit God's law, that absolute demand, with conditions where you can ignore. You can imagine up scenarios and situations where maybe that kind of love doesn't really apply. Where the victim of his own faults can be neglected. Where the poor laid at your gate could be forgotten. Or where the enemy can just be straight up condemned and never forgiven. You try to slip through the wide net of the accusation of God's law so that you can avoid God's wrath against your sin, and live. Do this, and you will live. Go and do likewise. These statements of Jesus, which are the bookends, the bookends for the parable, must be understood according to that parable. These statements are given in that context. Jesus explains what he means with the parable. So with it, of the good Samaritan, that parable, Jesus proved to that lawyer and really to you too, that neither he nor all of his crowd, including the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Levites, none of them had fulfilled any of God's commandments or practiced any works of love and mercy that could ever justify themselves. 
The lawyer comes to Jesus thinking to win glory away from him, away from Jesus, by his own godliness, his own keeping of the word. And then he learns that he's never done it, not even at all. Indeed, the lawyer has never even begun to do the law, not, even, not to mention even accomplished it, even though everyone around him likely thought of him maybe even as a saint. All his fellow lawyers praised him. The Pharisees, maybe even the high priest himself, would celebrate him and swear him to be the most pious and holy and wise man they'd ever known. He was as accomplished as the the greatest missionary, the most notable saint, or the wisest philosopher. That's what others probably thought of him, and probably true. And even humility, he probably thought some of that true himself. But again, notice the lawyer tries to weasel himself out of what Jesus demands. How he looks for a loophole in that absolute, unconditional command of God. Why? Because when Jesus says, do this and you will live, or go your way, or do likewise also, these words don't contain in them the means or the ability to do what they command. Jesus says, go and do, but that doesn't mean that you can. They never achieve what they demand, whether in your heart, your family, or your world. They are good and right and true, but they do not have in themselves the ability to fulfill them. So maybe you came to church today thinking Jesus was going to give you a big pat on the back for all the good you did this week in your work, your vocation. Maybe reward you a little bit for your labor. Or perhaps you thought Jesus was going to give you today a motivational speech to encourage you to be more like the Good Samaritan, showing love and mercy and compassion to the neighbor, more kind, more loving, more gentle, more patient, and the like. Or perhaps you have a burdened conscience already and you thought Jesus would sit you down and give you a stern talking to so that you would know what to do and amend your works and your ways. You can approach Jesus that way and you'll find plenty of words that agree. As the lawyer rightly confesses, God does speak this way. This is salvation by the way of the law of Moses. Make no mistake, that law which was given by God to Moses on the mountain is good and holy and commands purely holy works and, as the lawyer rightly confesses, promises life. It is rightly God's word. But what is wrong, however, is that no one has ever fulfilled this law perfectly. Not one, not even the most virtuous, pious, and holy saint has been able to save themselves by the word of the law. Instead, as you heard the apostle teach from Galatians 3, the law was given that we might learn of our weakness and inability, our utter inability to save ourselves in any way. It is, as we confess in the Catechism, a mirror that shows us that we haven't done a damn thing towards our salvation. So the response from the lawyer is incomplete. The response of faith when Jesus says, do this and you will live, is not, who is my neighbor? Instead, O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? That's the right response to the word of the law. Jesus is working by command and parable to do that in your hearts today too. To utterly humble you into confessing. He's not setting up for you another example of pious living so that you can save you. As good and right and true as it is to show love and mercy and compassion for one's neighbor. Instead, he's pointing you away from yourself, your own pride, your own works, your own thoughts that justify you, any boasting and mistaken righteousness. He's turning you around and returning you to faith in him who justifies and saves you freely out of his gracious giving without any works in me or merit. For Christ alone is your righteousness. He is your redemption. He is your salvation. 
Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the gate, the ladder, and the step by which you are brought to the Father. So, you are the man who departed the holy city of Jerusalem and went, made way for Jericho, that cursed city, abandoning the faith and the church for the secular worldview. You are the man who gets mixed up with thieves and their corruption and then finds that you have lost all the righteous clothing that is the gifts of Christ that were given to you. You are the wounded one, wounded by your actions and words, who doesn't even know if he could live another day in this world. You are the man who was left behind by everyone else for dead, there lying in the ditch. Behold, the man who cries out, God be merciful to me, a sinner, who can't do a, a damn thing for himself. And thus you are then the one whom Christ Jesus comes to have compassion. He comes to you and he heals your wounds with his forgiveness, binding them. Your body and soul are cared for as he pours upon you that oil and wine, his word of law and gospel, to heal you. He carries you on his own animal, like he carried his own cross, to the holy end of the church. And there Jesus entrusts you to his church and his preacher to care for you until you are delivered at last from every bit of hardship, anguish, distress, indeed every sin that you've brought upon yourself. Every, each day you get to hear, to learn, and to be fed. And finally, you are the baptized, and thus you are citizens, even now, of the heavenly Jerusalem, having your names written in God's book. You will be carried again together with all the elect children of God upon your Savior's shoulders as he brings you into his heavenly inn, the, hint, the inn of eternal life. May God grant it to you all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.